Welcome to the fourth part of this video series. In this video, we shall be discussing nutrition of the surgical patient. I would like to take your attention to the graph which is shown in the lower right hand side of the slide. Observe a band which is around um, somewhere between 7 to 10. This basically shows you that per day on an average one would excrete around 7 to 10 grams of nitrogen. As you are well aware, 1 is to 6, so 10 into 6 is roughly 6 grams of protein. Look below and the x-axis shows you the days. After any injury, depending on the severity, there is going to be an increased nitrogen excretion, which means to say that there is a lot of demand for proteins. And you can see the degrees to which it increases. After elective surgery, it's almost normal or near normal. But with infection, severe sepsis, skeletal trauma, major burns, the graph gets a sharp peak. This means to say that the amount of uh, protein that one needs increases after the trauma. So you, you know the reason for this. Uh, it was explained in the previous video. But in this video, you will try to understand that the goal of nutrition is to prevent or reverse the catabolic effects of injury and disease. But the best measure to gauge how good you are feeding the patient is the improvement of the patient. There are many ways to calculate the energy requirement. You can either use the Harris-Benedict equation. It's pretty long and complicated. Trust me, I can't remember it. I just know what the Harris-Benedict equation is used for. It's separate for males and females though. There is an easy, easier method which is used even in the ICUs. They calculate 30 ki uh, kilocalories per day. That's the first thing to know. Second thing is you should keep the non-protein calorie is to proteins at a ratio of 150 is to 1. The next thing to remember which is very famous fact that 1 gram of nitrogen is roughly 6.25 grams of protein. Always remember that you should be replacing the vitamins if necessary. Most enteral supplements don't have vitamin K, B12 and folic acid. The best method to feed the patient is through the mouth. So the enteral feeding is the best. This is because it stimulates production of IgA. It keeps the gut mucosal barrier intact. Reduce risk of infection. It also reduces the acute phase protein release. And it has been shown that people who have been fed enterally, I don't say orally, enterally, they have a reduced requirement of mechanical ventilation and even reduced lay of ICU stay. These are the different options for enteral feeding, the access basically. First is the nasogastric tube or nasoduodenal or nasogitinal tube. They are used only for short term, that means not beyond 30 days. And there is always a risk of aspiration because the uh, esophageal sphincter is splinted open. At the same time, nasopharyngeal trauma, for that people use softer tubes and it can be dislodged, the patients could pull them out if they are uh, not willing to have them, at the same time if they are agitated. Sometimes it could uh, you know, be difficult to place these tubes, uh, difficult to pass through the airways, the patient may not be cooperative at uh, some time, and often it is necessary to have a radiographic assistance, or at least a proof that the tube is in the right place. PEG is usually done by the endoscopists. Surgical gastrostomy is done by the surgeon. And if you compare the gastric tube and the jejunal tube, it is always better to have a jejunal tube. That's because if there could be gastroparesis or let's say aspiration, it's more common with a gastric tube. The jejunal tubes are far more safer and at least they avoid the risk of aspiration and gastroparesis. Fluoroscopic gastrostomy and fluoroscopic jejunostomy are a blind procedure. So, not really recommended. It has its own uh, risk. When it comes to the PEG jejunal tube, the similar technique to a PEG uh, gastrostomy, again is done by the GA department. 
the best thing to do is to do a varying jejunostomy surgically gives you a good result a simple procedure it can be even done under local anesthesia and the uh, only thing to do is know exactly when to feed and when not to the only contraindication to feeding is that if there is any distal obstruction so one should be a little careful and use a lot of common sense when feeding a patient after a jejunostomy A big question as to when, the, when to start the feeding as soon as you finish a feeding jejunostomy. Some people prefer to wait for the anesthesia effects to get reversed and the patient to pass flatus before starting the feeding whereas others prefer to wait for at least about 4 or 5 days to see if the tract should get mature. Anyway, finally please follow your local hospital policy. And um, the next point here is the different formula that you have for feeding. It could be a isotonic feeding as most feedings are which has a low residue then again there is something which is called an elemental diet which means to say that the basic elements are given you have very uh, simple sugars simple uh, proteins and peptides have been given apart from that you don't give uh, long chain fatty acids but you give medium chain and short chain fatty acids the reason here as you have seen in the previous video is that these can get easily absorbed and easily assimilated and they don't leave any residue so there is hardly a problem of uh, wondering when the patient is going to pass stool because everything gets absorbed and everything is elemental isotonic uh, formulae are also provided with fiber and this is so that the patient has an output at the same time they say fibers are very essential for the intestine to function and have good peristalsis and to prevent codex. Not to forget that uh, fiber also has an immune enhancing uh, property to some degrees because it says that it keeps the mucosa intact of the colon and it prevents the um, you know uh, mucosa from getting atrophied. Alright then uh, moving on to the next kind of formula that is a calorie dense formula here you don't have uh, something that's isotonic here it has either something which is more in uh, calories because they have to increase the density so it will it will be hypertonic and they also change the for the ratio between non protein calories to proteins so that could be a high protein formula when it comes to specific immune enhancing formulae they can add either glutamine arginine or omega-3 fatty acids the anti-inflammatory role of omega-3 fatty acids were touched upon in the earlier video whereas glutamine is the most commonest amino acid in the body it's a precursor of glutathione which is an antioxidant it's a fuel source for immunocytes it supplements I mean sorry if it's supplemented during stress and trauma it preserves the function of enterocytes, immunocytes and also enhances the nitrogen balance and as you know that glutamine is trophic to the intestinal epithelial cells. Arginine has its own immune enhancing properties and wound healing benefits. Therefore when both of these are added to the formula it's called an immune enhancing formula. Don't forget they even add uh, omega-3 fatty acid the third one. Now coming to the um, renal formula usually these renal formula are lower in volume they have lower potassium, phosphorus and magnesium. They usually contain essential amino acids and there is a high non-protein calorie is to nitrogen ratio. When it comes to the pulmonary failure uh, formula, usually the fats provide 50% of the calories. And the simple reason here is the, um, the thing which is called the respiratory quotient. As you know that if you burn carbohydrates, they give off a lot of CO2 and H2O in the uh, cellular respiration whereas when one takes fats there is a lower amount of CO2 that comes out so the amount of CO2 that somebody has to wash out is lot lesser when he is using fats so this is uh, the advantage of the pulmonary failure kind of a diet the hepatic uh, failure formula it has more than 50% of amino acids which are branched chain amino acids basically leucine, isoleucine and valine 
and uh, this has a role in reducing the encephalopathy. Various theories have been put forward to explain the hepatic encephalopathy. They believe it's all to do with the various neurotoxins, for example, short chain fatty acids, mercaptans, different neurotransmitters which come up, such as ammonia and uh, gamma aminobutyric acid. The role of ammonia is that uh, ammonia is produced when there is a metabolism of amines, amino acids, purines, and urea. And normally, ammonia is detoxified in the liver by conversion to urea in the TCA cycle or Krebs cycle. Ammonia is also consumed in the conversion of glutamate to glutamine. It is a reaction which uses glutamine synthetase. This enzyme is there in the skeletal muscles and it's also there in the brain. But when you increase the level of ammonia, the brain is not able to in increase the enzymatic activity. Now, in the likely event of a patient having hepatic encephalopathy, what usually does happen is that the glutamine is very useful for the uh, enterocytes. But uh, there is also production of uh, ammonia from the glutamine which is there in the, in the bowel. And all these toxins go into the liver and because of liver there is a photosystemic shunting. And these neurotransmitters are carried off over to the brain. The brain has a limited capacity to increase its enzyme activity and therefore this acts on the brain to cause hepatic encephalopathy. And the same kind of theory is also given as far as GABA is concerned. So giving a diet or a formula which is hepatic failure uh, formula is that it contains amino acids which are branch chain amino acids. And this has a role in reducing, although it cannot reverse, the encephalopathy. There are many indications for parental nutrition. And the rule of the thumb basically means if there are some GIT anomalies, if it's surgically removed like short bowel syndrome, or let's imagine if there is malabsorption, a very high output fistula, those who do not have intestinal function such as paralytic ileus for a long time, or malabsorption because of sprue or hyperproteinemia, and those who are having high obstruction at a very high level. So these can be remembered like um, rule for the thumb for TPA. IV nutrient solutions that you use could either be made commercially, usually by the Baxter company, or what I have seen in India and abroad is that the hospital produces their own um, nutrient formula. The hospital pharmacy does a pretty good job at that and uh, the solutions which they provide are pretty sterile and you have at least never faced any problems. So again, it depends entirely on your local hospital policy. Solutions that are available are Dextro solutions and 70% of the calories provided are by Dextro. So it makes sense. These solutions are pretty thick, not the usual 5% Dextros. It could be 10, 20, 25, 35, 50% Dextros also. The amino acid solutions are usually amino acids mixed with dextrose and 50% of the amino acids are essential amino acids. The lipid emulsions which are given come in small volume either 150 or 250 cc. They may either be given in a peripheral vein because they are isotonic or they may be infused along with the dextrose amino acid solution. And because the lipid emulsions are submicron droplets of phospholipids and cholesterols surrounding a triglyceride, there is a transient increase in triglyceride levels in the bloodstream for at least about 8 to 10 hours. Now, when one gives parental nutrition, don't forget that you need to give minerals and vitamins. Now, how do you go around formulating the TPN? Or how do you go around writing a prescription for TPN? First of all, you need to estimate the energy and protein requirement. As I told you earlier, you go by the formula of 30 calories per kg per day. Now you need to give at least about 1.4 gram per kg per day of protein and to make it easier for ourselves for calculation you can use 1.5. There are different solutions that are commercially available but right now what I am being seeing uh, you know in common use is A5D25 
which is basically 5% of amino acids which gives 50 grams per liter of protein and 25 dextrose which is basically 250 grams per liter. So to calculate the volume you take the protein into consideration. Okay, So how much protein would you require for an 80 kg individual? 18 to 1.5 divide by 50 so that gives you 2.4 liters. So if you need to transfuse or infuse 2.4 liters what is the calorie provided by the carbohydrates? So 2.4 into 250 into 4 so that means 2400 kilocalories. Let's uh, say that the patient requires 2700 kilocalories. Okay, So the remaining kilocalories are provided by the lipid. So you need 300 calories by lipid. Usually you have a 150 ml uh, solution which is 1 kilocalorie per ml. So you need around 2 cans, so 2 sachets of lipid infusate. So this is how you go around writing the formula for or how you go around calculating the requirement of TPN. The complications of TPN could be catheter related. So all the catheter related complications can be put here, infection. Sometimes the catheter may need repositioning because it could be somewhere up in the neck veins. Glucose intolerance due to hyperglycemia which is a common phenomenon. Hypophosphatemia which is part of the refeeding syndrome. Because as you know in biochemistry as you start using glucose as a source of energy with cellular respiration you start creating the ATP bonds and if supposing more bonds need to be created you need phosphate. So you lose phosphate at the same time when cells start getting built up the potassium is inside the cell so all the potassium gets sucked up and you also start losing magnesium so loss of these three electrolytes constitutes a refeeding syndrome fatty liver can occur as a consequence of TPN when too much of calories have been infused and this extra calorie gets converted to fatty acids in the liver and they get stored there hypercapnia can occur because there is too much of uh, energy at this point of time and all this energy gets burnt and there is too much of CO2 to wash out. Lipid infusions can also cause oxidative injury to the cells thereby promoting inflammation. And at the same time since the GIT is not being used, mucosal atrophy and acalculus cholecystitis are complications there. Thanks for watching. Like, comment, subscribe, email me.